Hello and welcome to another episode of the World Football Show here on Sports Tonight Live. I'm Mina Rizuki and I'm joined by the best European football expert, Gabriele Marcotti, my co-presenter. You're so kind. Are we going to say nice things to each other the whole show this time around? Yeah, I'm going to go for the nice thing today. <laughs> well, as you can see, it's just the, uh, it's just the two of us uh, uh, this week, but that's good because... Um, you know, more space for us in our opinions. Exactly, and that way we don't have to argue, um, or at least, you know, I think well, we can be nice to each other now that there's no third person. I think, I think we certainly can without <laughs> that, that strange German influence. But <laughs> the other good news is we've got some great Skypers lined up to, uh, for you today. We're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to start Different out talking leagues. from... Different yeah, yeah, we're going to start out. Well. Exactly, Cyprus and Applewell. Um, of course, that was the greatest, probably, story, other than the fact that Messi broke uh, Champions League records. Um, but what did you think of Nicosia? Do you think that they have a shot further, or it depends at where... What, at winning the Champions <laughs> No, 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 at, at winning the quarterfinals. If they are teamed with, say, like, you know, let's just say Napoli goes through it. I mean, it, it obviously all depends. It depends on the draw. It depends on what they do on the night. Uh, what I find remarkable about this team is, is, is two things. One is the manager. I, I, I think I think Jovanovic is just, you know, you talk about a good manager um, making his team more than the sum of their parts. He certainly sums that up. But secondly is the ability on the night that these players have to, to just go to the next level. I, I mean, except for Tchaikovsky, you know, Charlambidis may be, Ten years ago, possibly, you know, these guys would have been possibly Champions League caliber players. None of the others are yeah. uh, by any stretch. If you look at their past, where they came from, um, and yet on the night they, they come together and make a difference. Uh, I spoke to uh, um, a guy I know who, who's, who's a scout, um, and his team had deputized him to go and uh, and watch them in their uh, in a third third round uh, third prelim round against uh, Wisla Krakow and. They went out there, watched the first leg, and he was like, he wasn't really that impressed and kind of said, all right, these guys are obviously going on the return. And, and boom, they play the first half hour like, you know, crazy whirling dervishes. And, uh, and Krakow don't know what hit them. And if you look at it, that's something that repeated itself, you know, against Shakhtar Donetsk, yes. against Porto. You know, this, they, they can just take it to, to a different level and then sort of go back to normality. I think that, you know, whilst you're mentioning the good coach, I think it's also important to, to point out the fact that they have a great management and they are someone who have stuck together with their coach. They took the money that they had from their first Champions League outing, reinvested it back in the squad when the likes of Ammonia are like um, sort of squandering money and having to go through financial debt and everyone sort of playing for a six month plan, these guys have taken players like Nuno Moraes, built their team around it. And I think that a management has come through, stuck together with the coach, which is quite unusual, I understand, for Cyprus. We've got our Skyper with us, and we've got Andreas Vu. Hello, how are you, Andreas? Can you hear me? Andreas? I'm not sure he can hear us. No. Maybe he can, uh, he can join us in a, in, in a minute or two. Uh, well, you know, Andres is going to be talking to us about uh, about Cypriot football and uh, sort of where we where they are right now, and, and really whether Apple rep represents some kind of uh, resurgence or whether there's deeper issues there. This is what he's saying. He was saying that in in his article that he wrote, he was saying that five out of the six uh, teams, you know, the top six are sort of, you know, always changing their coaches. There's no youth development at the moment, and people sort of under, you know, youngsters have to go to military service and that at the moment they're sort of taking that route where they say, oh, it's Cyprus, how far can we get? And you can see it's really something oh. different. Can you hear us now, Andreas? Yeah, now I can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Um, we were reading your article and you were talking about sort of the growing crisis in Cypriot football and the fact that five out of six uh, managers in the, in the top six teams at the moment are changing uh, all the time. It's like a merry-go-round. So do you think Apple is sort of the only example of what's great about Cypriot football, or...? Exactly. Jovanovic is the main reason behind this team's success. I mean, he's the only manager that thinks long-term. I mean, you see nearly every club in Cyprus, whenever they sign players, they just bring them in on one-year deals. They change the squad nearly like 75% of the squad keeps changing every year. And that's the reason why no clubs can gain any stability. Okay, so do you think that at the moment that, uh, would you say that it's great management of the squad or is it, do you really think that it's Jovanovic, that it, he is the actual reason behind this great success? He is, because he was at Apple 
before this um, term. He was also there earlier in 2004, I think. And he spent two years there, so obviously knew the club very well. So it wasn't as if he was going into a new environment. Uh, but yeah, he's he's brought in some players that left their previous clubs as rejects. I mean, Nuno Marais, he he was released from Chelsea, and the previous manager was going to sell him. They were playing him centre back, right back, and they moved him forward to defensive midfield, and he's been one of the best midfielders in the Champions League. Uh, it's these man, man management skills that separates him from all the other managers in the Cypriot League. Uh, Andreas, you, you talked about sort of uh, uh, some of the difficulties, some of the uh, that Cypriot League teams face. Um, now, obviously, I guess a lot of it is about managing expectations. But compared to the size of Cypriot uh, of Cyprus, compared to the the history of Cypriot football. I mean, is the uh, is the situation really really that dire? When you know, in, a, in addition to Rafael, we've had uh, we've had uh, uh, Anatosis uh, uh, Gusta as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, do well, and uh, and we've had the Cypriot national team get some big results in, in qualifying. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure Andreas is with us anymore. But yes, yeah, sometimes it make me nice. Sometimes I wonder, you know, when you've got. I mean, I think obviously you don't judge from one team. I mean, Rafael. Uh, it could well be the tip of the, the iceberg, or, or they could be the statistical outlier. But Cypriot football over the past three to five years, and it's not just Apoel. I mean, they've achieved some some pretty decent results um, in, in, in qualifying as well uh, for, for the Euros and, and for the World Cup. They didn't qualify, but you know, for yeah, relative to the size good. of the country, it is quite remarkable. Of course, up to, up until Euro 2012, the qualifiers, in which I think they didn't even win any games. Um, and they drew twice. So in, in that sense, you could say that it's being masked because no one seems to have a long-term strategy. It, it seems to be a little like, um, let's just see what we can do and hope but Should you have a long-term strategy when you're a nation of one million people? You're never going to have the big that's their argument. Team. But shouldn't you also, I mean, think about it. Uruguay is how big? Uh, it's about three and a half million people. Okay, so it's, it, but it's still considered a small nation when you compare it to the likes of the, you know, Brazil, which is they're obviously in the same continent and they're having to fight Argentina and Brazil. But at the same time, they're proving to be at the moment more successful because they have a long-term strategy. They are looking for the future. Of course, they also have the benefit of having kind of history. Yeah, I think the history of Uruguay is probably what what sets them apart. So why can't and also be the the relative wealth, I think, of of Uruguay compared to the other countries in, uh, in, in South America. Yeah, you know, I GDP think gives highest, them, yeah. yeah. Certainly gives them, gives them quite an edge. Um, it, I think it is an interesting dilemma to face um, and, and, and to sort of deal with for these teams. And I also wonder how bad could Apple all be if they're only third in, in the Cypriot <laughs> League that's right what now. I mean. But I wanted to ask you because I, when I was watching the game for me, I thought, you know, when it went to extra time, there was no way that they just didn't manage anymore. Leon, in, in my opinion, had they stayed there, they seemed a little bit nervous. But Leon was certainly going to be <sighs> look like the more likely side to take it at the time. So do you think it was just a case of pressure? I mean, tactics have changed a little. It may well have been. I mean, I think there's no question. I've well found uh, uh, a second wind, I think, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that extra time. But Andreas is back with us. And yeah, Andreas, I was, sorry, I was just gonna. I was just gonna ask. You know, a, a, a lot of it is about perception and, and managing expectations. And you yeah. know, relative to the, the the past of Cypriot football, I mean, you might think that this is actually a pretty good era. It's not just Apoel. It's it's, it's certainly Famagusta a few years ago. The the Cypriot national team, I think, in uh, in was it in the 2010 World Cup qualifying, they got some big results against some big nations. Um, yeah, that's. It's, I think, um, like you said. It's a great achievement, of course. I mean, Anostas is only in 2008 with the first ever Cypriot team to qualify. Now we've had three out of the last four season teams in the group stage. So, of course, in that respect, it's improving. But um, I see a problem um, further down the line because every year the, the amount of foreign players in the league keeps increasing. I mean, it's down to foreign players that uh, so many teams are having success in the Champions League. But sometime that's going to run out, and we're not going to have any local players in our playing for our country. So you're also saying that 60% of the league, I believe, are f is made out of foreign players, and yeah. the fact that they seem to uh, admire older, experienced talent as opposed to new, young um, players coming through the ranks. So do you think the fact that they continue to rely on backward mentality is going to 
do you think this is going to yeah, continue? Basically? I think it's going to catch up on us pretty soon. Uh, like you said, in Cyprus, we've got a bit of a complex in all industries, not only in sport. It's just they always think the older is better, where they don't seem to trust the youth. Whereas, as you see in football, a lot of the times, fresh, fresh mentality, there's less fears amongst the youth. Like, I mean, you've got youngsters in the Premier League starting from 17, 18 years old, and they only improve as a result. Whereas in Cyprus, they get to about 22, 23 years old, and they're still considered as uh, prospects, which is clearly not the case. Um, do, do you think that having very nearby, uh, you know, bigger, wealthier leagues, like, like the Greek League, for example, is that something that maybe Cypriot Lux, uh, clubs can look to harness? Uh, I mean, would it be a bad thing if, the, if, if talented Cypriot youngsters aren't getting their shot at, at a young age in the Cypriot League? Would it be a, a good thing for Cypriot football as a whole if, I don't know, maybe they, they move to Greece or, 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 or some other countries nearby and developed for, for a few years? Yeah, um, I've insisted on it for years now, Cypriot, for Cypriot young talents to, um, to achieve a, a big career, they need to move from a young age. And the problem is in Cyprus, from 18 to 20 years old, they're in the army. So there might be a talent that's coming through 17 years old, and then his career goes downhill because of the army. He comes out 20 years old, and you see, in football terms, that's the age where you have to be break, trying to break into the first team, at least knocking on the door. Whereas Cypriot kids are only starting their careers at 20. And the problem is that so many managers over here just prefer foreign talent. It's the reason. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Andreas. That's all we've got time for. But, um, you know, people must read. Can you tell us where we can find that article, to those who haven't read it? Uh, it's footballpanorama.wordpress.com. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Andreas. Thanks. Thank you, Andreas. That's footballpanorama.wordpress.com for those who might not have uh, might not have caught it. And you know, it, it's funny because different countries obviously have their own issues with developing uh, uh, young players, and it has to do with their history and their culture and their economy. But the bottom line, it's a complaint everywhere. Is that you know, <laughs> exactly. go with youth, play more young players, <laughs> play more young players. Um, but, uh, one league that certainly doesn't have that problem is, of course, Spain. And after the break, we'll be talking about them, the refereeing errors, and much, much more. So we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Well, we're back. It's uh, Gabe Marcotti and, of course, uh, Mina Rizuki. And uh, you're watching the World Football Show now. Let's go for, uh, for a bit of Espana now, shall we? Because okay, week after week, those two guys keep scoring. It's 50 goals now for, uh, <laughs> on the season. It's getting ridiculous. It, 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 it does seem completely absurd. But in the league, of course, it's not Leo Messi who's ahead. It's, uh, it's Cristiano who's got, who's got 32 goals, only 40 goals. He's 10 goals behind Messi overall. I, it, seems, it seems absurd. So. I guess if you're in Spain, I mean, I think there's a number, as you know, a fascinating sort of uh, um, uh, sort of secondary stories involving a number of clubs. But if you want to write about the top two, you know, you can either talk about the Ronaldo v Messi, um, you know, goal by goal competition, or otherwise, what do you talk about? You talk about refereeing mistakes, right? That was a big so issue. There's so many, though. But it's, it's starting to get really ridiculous because. A little bit, it's like you don't want to watch it, you know, like I complain so much about the Italian league and then you see, oh, it was daylight robbery. It was daylight robbery. Wait, refereeing mistakes makes you, make you not want to watch? No, it like doesn't make me want to watch. You won't be watching any more Bolton against QPR then? <laughs> but, that was outrageous. Right. But anyway, it, it, it's a case of, you know, of course, you know, it was like, did Javi Alonso, he admitted to the fact that he did touch the ball. You know, Gucci is joking about it, saying Sergio Ramos can be just as good a goalkeeper as, you know. Well, I, for those who know, we should have some background for those who aren't as religious Liga watchers as, as we are. Um, but it was... Uh, Two handballs. Yeah, Real Madrid took on um, uh, Pepe Mel's uh, uh, Betis, who well, you don't quite know what you're going to get. If you get them on a good day, uh, there it's like watching... Uh, Watching sort of a mini cross between Barcelona and so they play uh, really, and really beautiful yeah. football. They're, they're, they are pretty to watch, and sort of like the early like Wenger, not early, but like the, the Wenger's Arsenal maybe of, uh, yes. of of 06 or 07 or something. But and it worked. I mean, they went toe to toe. Uh, I thought Madrid conceded a few things at the Very back. Very open and stuff. at the back. Very open. 
it gets to 3-2 and then in the dying minutes, and uh, I don't know if you can see this, uh, this graphic here, I think, well, make your own judgment, but it's uh, Sergio Ramos uh, handling the shot in the box. Uh, well, quite this is the clearly. thing we don't actually know. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> Marco well, really, claims that it, it well, was him on the side. Here's the thing, and I mean, this is why still photography is dangerous. Um, it looks from the picture we have up in our studio that it's uh, hitting him in the arm. It's also possible, if several people have pointed out, that it actually hit him on the thigh, and in that precise moment in time, is simply bouncing up, yeah. you know, over his arm. So, and, and also if it hits his thigh first and then goes to his arm, you know, is it really, is, is it a voluntary handball? Because, you know, he's got to do something with his arm. It's not like he can tie it behind his back, right? So this is basically what we're dealing with. If it's, you have to give the benefit of the doubt. I mean, if we've been discussing the fact whether or not this hit him on the thigh or this actually hit him on the arm for so long, and as it has been discussed in the, in the Spanish newspapers, then I would say they made the right decision by not giving that, you know? Obviously, it's not clear cut. But uh, the Xavi Alonso one, on the other, on the other hand, which he, you know, also yeah. ha did handle, in fact. I don't know if there's as good a picture of that, but uh, Mina, for for our listeners, the ball came in. It looked like it hit his arm, and um, he he claimed afterwards that it in, in fact it did. But he and, said and his arm it was wasn't, up to the referee. Yeah, his arm wasn't that far away from his body. To be fair, I think. Yeah. But by the same token, it's kind of silly afterwards to go and say like well yeah it probably did but it's up to the referee to get the call right what's he gonna say well i mean and i don't think we want to create a situation where either where we create this environment where players are saying yeah i can get away with whatever i want it's up to the referee to stop me i mean i think a lot of referees feel very strongly that you know so they're there to play with the players you know the, the players are comp they're not competing against the referee it's not like oh i'm going to pull one over on the referee you know? okay so you think that he should have walked up to the referee and said well I actually did touch my arm if he knew and he was 100 percent sure at the time yeah i, I think it would have been a nice gesture I, I i think it would have been an ethical gesture playing within the rules now i like javi alonso i've had the pleasure of meeting him a few times actually not the name drop and i think he's a great guy and i don't think he's a bad person for not doing it mm. But I think we should try to instill a culture where if, you, if it's obvious, and there are people who've come out before. Yeah, you know, of course there uh, have and, been. And, but and, and, and they've admitted it. So I think it's something that you want to try to promote. But um, we should get a third opinion on this, yes. um, apart from our own. And we're joined by uh, Tim Stannard. You know him as the legendary blogger La Liga Loca, uh, which, uh, and you can follow him on Twitter or indeed on 442's website. Uh, Tim, why don't we put... Um, Xavi Alonso through the moral and ethical maze. Uh, if he was 100% sure, uh, should, he have had, should he have come out and told the referee and won some brownie points? Um, I, think Marie, I think Jose Mourinho would have lynched him. I think he's about to say Jose Mourinho would have <laughs> lynched him. Um, he's kind of frozen there. See, and I've got to ask him this because I'm not so sure Mourinho would have lynched him. Because you know how we're seeing sort of good Mourinho? Oh, who was saying that Betis deserved a point. Exactly. And he, and he said something, you know, like last week as well, he said something similar. I'm wondering if with good Mourinho around, he would have seen Why not take it. advantage of... Uh... Right, you only have about a billion points in the league, right? <laughs> What's going to happen? You still got the three points. You still got the victory. But no, I don't think so because these are exactly the games that you have to win because you never know when... The great thing that sort of the... Ad Barcelona are in some ways in an advantageous position where they can sort of sit back and say, well, we've given up on the league. We can concentrate on the Champions League. The minute that, ba that Real Madrid stop dropping points, they're just going to come back and you never know what Barcelona can do. They need to drop a lot of points. But let's, uh, Tim's back with us. Uh, Tim, were you about to say that Jose Mourinho would have lynched him? I'm not sure Tim, Tim is with us. Um, but... You know, it, it, it is an issue, uh, I'm, and I'm just wondering, though, if you want to project it out to sort of the, uh, uh, the, the broader Mourinho issue right now, because, you know, there's this business with him. Is he, is he going to leave uh, uh, La Liga? Is he not? Oh, I personally okay. think yeah. he's going to extend his contract and stay. But, uh, and sort of the kinder, gentler Mourinho as well. You see, you see that quote that he came out with? Because all season long, I, I personally feel, he's been trying to wind up Pep Guardiola, who, of course, <laughs> has been like... No, 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 I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm the good one. He's the naughty one. Mourinho says, ultimately, delivers the biggest insult in Guardiola's head. He says, You're just like me. You are just like me. We are exactly alike. 
And that's what gets under his skin. Where, where Guardiola has to fire back, and he says, "The way that he fired back, it was like, calm down." Well, he's right, though. He says, "Except for the fact that we both want to win, I think anybody can look at our histories and the things we've said and the things we've done in our body of work and say, no, we're nothing like each other." Okay, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna stand up for him for a second then, because what he said was, "Whatever I say." I say in public, when I don't like something, when I don't like something, I say it out there. I don't use a third party. You know, there are... Was his nose growing as he said that? But, but okay, then, sorry. I do think that at the end of the day, like, you're right, of course, the way that they handle one is just, you know, like the epitome of class, and one is, let's say, the epitome of not class, yeah? yeah. And that one is the one who says the other, tells the other guy, we're exactly the same. But having said that, you know, I, I can't tell you that Pep Guardiola hasn't done some naughty things, you know, like he isn't the holier than thou image that you like I don't, to see. I mean, look, I, and I do think that not. is no, but that is kind of hypocritical. I mean, that's the reason why we like players like Balotelli, because they are upfront about who they are. Whereas with Pep, you always feel like there's something that's not quite there. You, it's just you can't be that perfect and you can't be that nice. And the way that he jumped, going, well, I would have to review my behavior if this is what I okay, was like, well, you know, it's like really. Hey, Listen, while we're on the issue, we're talking about sort of a, a, a bad Guardiola. Um, I'll give you something straight away you can sink your teeth into. The guy takes money from Qatar to go and be their representative and lobby for them. And, uh, and, and that's part of the reason why they got the World Cup. If you want to go out and say something less than perfect about Guardiola, you've got all the money in the world. Why you got to go and sell yourself uh, over to the Qataris if you want to go bring that up. That said, more than judging, you know, which is the good manager and which is the bad manager of people, I find it interesting that, you know, Mourinho m trying to gain this, you know, sort of uh, f from a cerebral point of view, more mind games, you know, how do I get into Pep Guardiola? I know, I'll say something like this and get a rise <laughs> out of him. And, and I agree with you, if you're Guardiola, you should just shut up. I mean, you've, you know, you've worked on your this image. This is what I mean. There's no reason to answer back to that man, you know, uh, it's... You know, he's the guy who goes and pokes, you know, people's eyes and talks and, you know, attacks UNICEF and all this nonsense, right? You know, if you want, you want to keep the higher moral ground. You know, you've lost the title uh, this season, most likely. Just keep the higher moral ground. Why didn't he just say something like, yeah, we are alike, I guess, you know, in the way that he did say we both, you know, we both want to win. I don't think there's much more, but, you know, let's just leave it at that. When he have just kept his old class that he talks about. But this is the thing with Pep, you know, you're never quite sure. I, I don't like the way that he constantly makes Barcelona sort of wait on tenterhooks, whether or not he's going to reconfirm his position, whether he can still be committed to the team, you know. And anyway. Well, we, we promised you uh, Tim Stannard. Uh, unfortunately, he won't be joining us at this point. It seems that uh, his uh, uh, technical difficulties have, uh, uh, have manifested themselves. But, um, Mina, I want to get from you. Going back to this Messi and Ronaldo thing and, and this goal scoring, if you, look at, uh, um, if you look at the history books and you compare them with the goal totals in recent seasons by other players, I mean, they are statistical outliers. Uh, they're just sort of beyond everything else. Mm. I, I think the next highest total the last 20 years was uh, the 32 league goals, which was uh, Diego Forlan, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I think you go back to 1989, I think Ugo had 38 goals or 37 goals, okay. something like that. I'm going by, by, uh, memory. Uh, by memory here. But, I mean, these two guys are freaks of nature. Is it the kind of thing, well, first of all, the obvious question, because there's people out there going to say, like, well, it's because the rest of La Liga is rubbish. We can establish <laughs> that it's not that the rest of La Liga is No, especially is with Atletico Bilbao's performance. Well, well, you look at Bilbao, you look at Atletico Madrid reaching the, uh, or, or I should say, winning the Europa League. Sevilla has won the Europa League. Uh, Villarreal last um, year. Villarreal's done well. Valencia as well. Has, you know, they've, they've made runs in the Champions League. So I think we can Hold safely that out, say yeah. that that's not the case. So then... Is the implicit question then that, you know, these guys aren't flat track bullies and we're watching sort of football's equivalent of Muhammad Ali or, or Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods? It's tough. Tiger Woods on the golf course. That's <laughs> what I'm talking about. Not, Not the bad scoring dude. women. All right. Um, <laughs> Dirty minded people. <laughs> what I was going to say is. Yeah, they are freaks of nature, but they have teams built around them, and they have legendary teams built around them. I mean, the Galacticos, who have, what, the best squad in the world? Real Madrid? Certainly the most expensively assembled squad in team the in the history of the universe, plus the highest paid manager in of the course, history of the universe. Of course, you know, uh, backed up by history and money and everything you can imagine. And then Barcelona, who sort of have the same philosophy since, like, you know, 
football was first invented by the sounds of it, you know, and who've gone through, he has great talent behind him. And, you know, you look at the youth that's coming up, you know, like the Quinkers and the Tiagos, they're very good, but do you see any of them being like, do you not think that was just one freak year where they just had the most amazing youth built? Because barring Teo, I can't really see any of them being as essential to the squad in the way that Xavi, Iniesta, Fabregas, you know. I, I think Thiago, is. to be fair, I think Thiago can, can grow in to be that One of kind the of best. players. But, I mean, these are great players with great squads um, behind them. Yeah. But I, I just want, I'm, I want to go back to this, though, leaving aside the reasons why, because, you know, there's, in fact, you could argue that if you're a great player on a great squad, it's harder for you to score you know, such a high proportion of goals because the goals Other are going to be will come. and the goals are going to be spread out. Well, if you look at Messi, the last three years, okay. he's finished first, second, and third in La Liga in terms of the number of assists he gives. Um, stuff like this makes me think that these guys really are on that sort of otherworldly plane. Well, they are, but w would you agree with this? Because they say things that there's no such thing as raw talent. But you see, the way that I look at Ronaldo is I define him as hard work. He's a player who comes in two hours before training and trains for two hours after training ends, you know. He's really dedicated to the cause. But then you look at Messi and you can't help but think that's just, that's something he was born with because of the way that, you know, his artistry. But then people say there's no such thing and footballs get really upset when you say to them, they say oh, it's all a question of hard work. There's no player that's born with this gift. Well, I, I think, I mean, what little I figured out is that you need the gifts and you usually need the hard work to go with it. And that, you know, people think that, you know, the great players like Zidane just rolled out of bed. No, he, he did put in the tremendous amount of, of work to go with it. But then again, had he not been born Zidane, that work would have kind of been pretty meaningless. Um, so I, I think it is about, you know, you, the, the two have to go together. And also, I think it's safe for assume all top, top professionals really work really, really hard. I mean, I'm sure Ronaldo's not the only one coming in two hours before training, is he? Really? No, in, in Real Madrid, he is. He is the most devoted. Well, that, that's what you hear. These are the stories that are always said about Ronaldo. He's always been the most devoted player. But although he looks like he's an idiot, you know, <laughs> and the, all his hair gels and everything. Right. But I do want to actually talk about, um, you were mentioning this before, with regards to the Spanish league being, you know, not the best and everyone compares it. But Athletic Bilbao and their performance against Manchester United and the fact that yesterday, you know, they left three of their best strikers on the bench, oh, sorry, three of their the best players on the bench. Do you think that it's wrong that they're, they're putting the Champions League, uh, sorry, Europa League rather, ahead? Well, a, I can give you a short answer and a long answer. My short answer is no. I think it's important for Bilbao to win, to win some silverware rather than go into the Champions League next season. They will likely have to sell some players. But the longer, more involved answer, Mina, I'm really sorry. We're going to have to wait till next week because uh, uh, we're <laughs> just about out of time with this segment. But uh, we're going to come back uh, in a little bit with two of my favorite countries in the world, my own country, Italy, and, of course, Argentina. All right, who's in the mood for some more sackings? And that can only mean one thing. It's Serie A. Uh, 15 managerial changes this season in Serie A. But don't be deceived because some of those are, uh, are those situations where, you know, crazy owners like uh, uh, Cilino, you know, or Zamparini. Uh, on Saturday, there's a whole bunch of them in Italy. You know, they like to keep three or four managers <laughs> under contract, and they keep bringing one in, sending the other one out. Zamparini just today coming out and saying, hmm, Bortolo Muti is a lovely man. I think he'll be okay for the rest of the season, which <laughs> pretty think, much guarantees that the next 10 days okay. he, will be, he will be sacked. But, I, listen, we're going to start be at the top of the table because this may be remembered as the turning point of the season. Uh, oh, with uh, not. Milan winning uh, against Lecce 2-0. Um, Ventus drawing again against Genoa, who have the worst defensive record right. in Serie A. And this was a Juventus team without their three best central defenders. But to be fair, Genoa had most of their defense out as well, uh, which is why this guy named Roger Carvalho, who I think they just found off the street. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what that. he does for a living. Came in to uh, partner Kaka Kaladze. Um, but let's start. Uh, let's start. We'll talk some Juve, and then we'll go to Tancredi for, for Milan also, because I think he's got some a uh, little bit of update in uh, chapter number 99 of the madness of Ibra. Um, but starting with that Genoa game, 
I did this game here uh, in the UK for ESPN, and I thought Juve, you know, they conceded an early chance, but then they played well. They created a lot of chances, hit the woodwork three times, had a goal which, you know, I thought was a marg very, very marginal offside call. Um, Conte, who well, wasn't there, was up in the stands, was clearly co uh, communicating with the bench, yeah. uh, even got creative. He got, we, you know, we got to see Del Piero and the mysterious Algero Elia uh, on the pitch. It's almost like he tried everything he possibly could, but it just didn't happen for him. You have to feel sorry for them at the moment because I do think that, you know, you could say that they've run out of steam and all of this business, but they really hadn't, you know, like, and you actually saw Marquisio who sort of dropped off in the last, well, I guess since actually they started tinkering with the formation, going with a 3-5-2. Marquisio is no longer making those darting runs and he seems a little bit tired at the moment. But this was a good Juve, like you were saying, they were really caring and I do think that Vucinic, who never seems to care anymore, was playing on, you know, at his best. Um, Matri was unfortunately not converting the chances that he usually is so good at doing. Um, you have to just say it's a case of bad luck. And it, it really, you know, obviously what's happened since then is that they had Pepe uh, goal rule offside and you said it was marginal to me. I thought it was very obvious that he was uh, not onside. Um, but uh, since then, Conte and Juventus have ruled in media silence. They refuse to speak about it because of all the decisions that keep going against them. But Barring these things, you do feel that they are unlucky hitting the crossbar, not managing, you know, going wide and an empty goal. Well, we've got with us uh, uh, a man who's objective in this title race because he's either uh, a fan of, of Juve or of uh, of Vivan, sure. and that's uh, objective. <laughs> and, and, and that's uh, Tancredi pa uh, Palmeri. Tancredi, ciao! You got to start. You got to start. Maybe you can cheer us up. Mina, as you, as you heard, is depressed. Uh, the title may be gone. Title looks like to be gone. And didn't I say to you, didn't I say ages ago, I said 60% to Milan, and every, both of you chose 51%. Oh, don't, start, don't start to be like Conte. Don't start to do in that way. Come I on. said to I, you that it looked like it was going to be Milan's. You guys went with Juve. You still it's, think it's, so? It's still not done, man. Eh? Still, there's still some match days. There's eh? still something going on. You should believe that. Don't, don't, don't drop just the league. By the way, I want to believe that you are more the best because... Uh, this week, I'm not there. I'm strongly believing that. <laughs> but, uh, by the way, yes, as you said, Juve, of course, was, uh, well, yeah, it was unlucky because hitting double uh, two times the post uh, and actually a uh, lot of people, a lot of critics, and I actually agree with, with them. They said that it was one of the best played game from them uh, this season. Uh, one thing I disagree with you, uh, Mina, is when you say that uh, that all the chances that Madri had, uh, usually he's converting that. I'm sorry, but it's like we are at the 27th match day and Madri so far scored just 10 goals. I mean, I like Madri. I think that he's all certainly not a world class finisher, and I don't mean to say that at all, but I'm saying there were chances there that usually he would have gotten, even being at the standard that he is, which isn't world class. But I, I thought that he missed more than that. And you say that, but he hasn't been playing every second. Uh, every single game, and for some reason recently, Marco Borriello has been favoured. Sure, but this is one of the games where uh, one striker has to strike. I'm sorry, it has to be. That there is not alternative. You can be unlucky, but honestly, some for something like 80 minutes, Juventus was there up in front. Matri is helping so much the building up there up front. But maybe sometimes it's also that it's like it's. He's, he's giving out a lot of, uh, also focusing, because, you know, there are that kind of uh, striker that they just think on, uh, on that moment that they have to strike, yes. and they are so focused on that. Matt is so uh, useful and helpful, uh, but sometimes, sometimes can be that. Can be like that. Really, I, I think the Juve strikers can be summed up with the simple fact that if the Juve strikers were as good as the Juve midfielders or the Juve goalkeeper, then Juve would be fighting for the Champions League title and not squandering the Serie A title. But... I, I, I want to ask you, though, about... Um, it's really well put. Thank yeah. you. Mm, nice yeah. and succinct. But <laughs> I, I want to ask you quickly about, about Conte, this media silence, his complaints about, about referees. Yeah. What, are well, the, well, what is their objective? Is their objective that the referees will somehow be better? Does, does Andrea Agnelli think that, oh, if we don't talk to the media, then the referees will suddenly improve next week? Or does Andrea Agnelli want the referees to go out there next week and say, Oh, this is a 50-50 call. I better give the benefit of the doubt to Juventus. Okay, that's well, just... No, no, no. Can I just make a point? No, wait, Tancredi, one, one second. 
Why is it that whenever... A 50-50 call is 70% they shouldn't give up. There is, they don't know what is a 50-50 call. I think that simply it's just that Conte protested. Maybe in the moment he shouldn't have. Thank you, lady. One second. I just want to make a, a valid point, yeah? And, and for a second here, forget everything about my history. I'm just posing a really serious question to you, yeah? When Donna Doni didn't want to comment after that match in which Parma were done for last week, yeah, did he not call a media silence? Of course, but what okay, are you doing? Why Donadoni do we here? never discuss any other team? But for because some nobody reason, cares about Donadoni and Parma. So when Galliani is running, yeah, at the time with the Milan Juve match, okay, yes. when he's running to the middle of the thing and shouting at Conte, it seems to be okay. just a little bit that Juventus seems to get a lot more comfortable when they can play as opposed to any other club in Serie A. I think, as I recall, I was right here saying that Galliani and Milan's behavior was completely was absurd low. after that game because, of course, Juve also had a goal. But should they have a off. right to call a media silence, even if it is no, a wrong judgment? No, you don't. Judgment? You don't. You, uh, listen, guys, listen, you say you things the way they are. If you, think, if, if you think that there is some kind of weirdo plot against you, which I think based on this season's evidence there really isn't. I don't think they isn't. believe that there's a weirdo plot okay, against them. They They're shut just the angry. hell up and get on with it, and I'll tell you why, okay? Because I don't know if Andrea Agnelli understands this. I don't know if he inherited just the money or any of the business sense from, uh, from, his, gri from his grandfather, from his dad less so. But um, <laughs> the, the, reality, the reality is that Juventus are running a business. They spend a lot of money to create this stadium. They are the most popular club in Italy. They're, they're trying to try to sell the Serie A brand again after the, the problems that we had in 2006 in Calciopoli. I don't need to tell you which clubs were implicated in that, but many were. Um, the best you can do now, there's certainly more than one, but uh, the, the best you can do now is go and try to give off a positive image. And for most of the season, that's exactly what Conte was able to do. And now it seems that over the last six weeks, while on the one hand they say, oh, we're, we've overachieved just by being second this year, and I would agree with them, on the other hand now, it seems to me they're undoing so much of the good stuff that they did earlier in the season. Am I yeah. wrong here? There Where's Lapo when you need him? There is also another point, uh, even if we consider that Andrea Agnelli belongs to the, the Juventus tradition, uh, all in all, but actually this is just on the paper, because actually he, he is just in his second uh, real season of being on the pitch, you know, and uh, as well contacts in the first year that he's uh, uh, racing at this level. So uh, we shouldn't forget that probably uh, not everything is like a planned strategy. So after that, Conte, maybe too early, spoke about uh, some mistakes, uh, some uh, bad refereeing, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, maybe I now uh, they are just trying. So they said, OK, let's try this strategy. Also, because after what happened in Mina Juventus, I mean, you, you really can't walk every step because then it's coming, uh, it's coming against yeah. you. And all in all, we should remember, Juventus against Chievo, I don't want to make the list of mistakes. No, 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 Tancredi, Tancredi. Yeah. Let's not do that. We're not on Italian television here, um, yeah. <laughs> thankfully. But I want to get you, though, on uh, uh, we have a couple minutes left. I don't think we can, we can let Ibra get off on this one. So yeah, yeah. Ibrahimovic, set, the, let, Milan went 2-0 against Lecce. Ibrahimovic uh, sets up a beautiful goal for Nocerino. Deflected, Mina will say, but still a nice goal. Yep. And then he scores, uh, he scores a, a, a beautiful second goal of his own. Um, he's the top scorer in Serie A right now. After the match, <laughs> something happens with a journalist yes, who simply is. asks him, I'll, I'll, I'll relate the first part, you relate the second part. Um, yeah. He simply asks him, like, well, what happened after the Arsenal uh, defeat last week because there were rumors of arguments between him and Allegri? And, you know, he answers the questions not very happily. And then he's giving an interview with another journalist. <laughs> and you want to describe what happens now to, to, to this deranged man? Can yeah, well, at first... Ibrahimovic said to the to the girl, to the journalist, that I, I want to tell you this this, guy, this girl, she's from uh, Sky Italy. Uh, she's very prepared journalist, the one that is always covering Milan, and not at all the kind of journalist that is going there, uh, provocating person. But she's doing her job, you know. Uh, so I was saying, uh, so today you will not be angry towards Allegri. And Ibra said, who said? Who said that I will be angry towards Allegri? Who said? Journalists, just you talk too much. You too, you talk too much like the others that, you know, it is a bit aggressive. Still, then he had the second flash interview with the other TV, and uh, the girl, the, the journalist, was quite 
still a bit shocked and uh, actually respect to her because she was waiting for Ivra uh, not to have an interview but just to clear with him something like look I was just doing my job I don't understand why you should react in this way so she was uh, standing in a couple of meters far from him in front of him waiting for him and while he was doing the interview he just looked at her and said so what, are, what the f words you are looking at then he, he took off his uh, hair clip and threw at her and actually, uh, when then he went off air, he also told her uh, to go back to kitchen. There you go. Oh, thank you so thank much you. for uh, uh, relating the, 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 the next installment in the insanity that is Ibrahimovic. I guess you got to take the good with the bad when it comes to Ibra. But um, apparently, as I said, that there was a statement on Milan's website. Uh, the, 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 there was a clarification. I think there should be a complete and total public apology. Uh, I think what he of said course, was sexist, it was stupid, and he's a professional. He's one of the highest paid guys in the world. Chivalrous. He's representing, you know, it's not just about chivalry. It's about, uh, it's about not anything. being, it's about, yeah, basic This is manners. kind of good for Milan in the sense that they like the sort of angry Ibra player. He, but, he performs better with them when he's angry. Speaking of angry, let's go off to Argentina. Woo! See, we are the world football There show. is a very <laughs> angry man, uh, not Rupert Fryer. Rupert Fryer is the very learned man who will... Educate us. Um, Got to start with this incredible game. Now, I, I've watched a bit of, for those who don't know, Boca Juniors under their very love, love, lovable and, and, and cuddly uh, manager, Mr. Falcioni. Um, I went on this long winning streak, where, uh, or long undefeated streak, I should say, where basically they played some of the dullest, most defensive football mm -hmm. I have seen in a long time. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rupert. Beautiful. But now they go, they, they play Independiente, and the game finishes 5-4. to four. And Boca's streak is over. What happened? Last place in Dependiente. <laughs> what didn't happen is probably a <clears throat> more apt question. Um, it, was, it was quite thrilling. Um, every bit as unexpected as it was thrilling, actually. Um, <clears throat> as you alluded to before, Boca have, have got a fantastic defence. Um, they were yet to concede a goal at all this season. Um, we're only four games in, but still, they were yet to concede yet. Independiente, in contrast, had scored, managed just one goal in four games. Um, they lost all four. Their coach, uh, Ramon Diaz, resigned a week previously. Uh, we all set up for a storming Boca victory, really. Um, for Boca to get <clears throat> back in the flow following a disappointing uh, defeat to Fluminense in the Copa Libertadores. Um, after 30 seconds, Boca won no back, won no behind. Uh, a few minutes later, it was two. And from then on, it was it was pure mayhem, really, Gab. Rupert, can you, can you describe a bit um, Falcioni? Because, <clears throat> you know, he goes on this run. He's not everybody's cup of tea. He's kind of the antithesis of somebody like Say Indeed. Bielsa, for example. Yeah, yeah or very much so. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, very much so. Um, Boca were 36 games unbeaten, believe it or not, uh, prior to Wednesday's de uh, last Wednesday's defeat to that fleet defeat to Fluminense in Libertadores. Um, prior to last night, they were 33 games unbeaten in the league. Uh, in indeed, last night uh, they conceded one goal fewer than they did in the whole of last season combined. <gasps> um, <clears throat> so yeah, it was. It's a uh, is he a good manager, or is he just one of those guys who parks three buses in front of the goals? Because that's what he can't figure out from a distance. He divides opinion, doesn't he? He very much divides opinion, yeah. Um, there was a lot of complaints, actually, last season, believe it or not, uh, when Boca won the title. Um, I, I think I remember Falcioni indeed telling people, oh, if you don't like it, watch something else on television. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like you said, he, divide, he divides opinion. Um, Boca now... Uh, uh, Raquel May, of course, the playmaker is sort of seen as symbolic, as emblematic of, of this expansive, attractive football that Boca play. And some of the players have, have, have uh, voiced their concerns before with the overly cautious uh, approach of Falcioni, as have some of the board members, so too the fans. But who, who, who can complain when you're 36 games unbeaten and, and your, best, your greatest rivals are, play, uh, are relegated? So. Do you think that this is going to start some psychological... Uh you know, problem in which they're going to start conceding more, you know, because you said that they lost last week and now that they conceded this much to Independiente, do you think that this, this is going to have a psychological bearing on them? Um, <clears throat> it may have some. I mean, I think uh, most of the talk this morning, at least uh, throughout the Argentinian media, has, has mainly been uh, looking ahead now to Wednesday, uh, where Boca resumed their Libertadores for a uh, campaign against Arsenal. Um, like, as prior to the... Uh, to that defeat to Fluminense, they had drawn 0-0 in, in Venezuela um, uh, with Zamora, which was seen as an extremely disappointing result and which heaped a lot of pressure on Falcioni. There's a huge fallout between the players and the coach. Indeed, Falcioni actually tendered, tendered his res resignation the next day, according to reports. Um, that was eventually smoothed over. over. 
And so, yeah, this, this, this blip is, is um, everybody seems to be struggling to sort of try and, to, try and explain what's happen, happening at the moment, really. Um, a lot of what happened against Fluminense was kind of explained away by the absence of, believe it or not, Rolando Schiavi, who will be 40 next year. Um, Falcioni brought him in and he seemed to organise a defence. He, he was probably, arguably, perhaps a player of the year last season. He was missing against Fluminense, but he, he returned last night, so everything uh, was expected to resume. We all expected uh, business as usual to resume at La Bobanera. But obviously it didn't. It, it, it's strange too, in as much as it's kind of last night and perhaps that defeat I keep alluding to against Fluminense, it's kind of been a hark back to pre Falcioni where where it's just mayhem at the Bombonera every week, where they were giving away poor goals, where they were making mistakes in defence, where the goalkeeper was, every goalkeeper they seemed to bring in, bring in had pretty much had a nightmare. Uh, that's one of the uh, other things that Falcioni did was he brought in uh, Agustin Orion uh, to play in goal, who's, who's been superb. I think he's kept 15 she clean sheets in his last 23 games. He's been magnificent, but he, even he let the side down yesterday, especially I think for the second uh, Ferreira's free kick. He uh, incorrectly guessed that Ferreira was going to go over the wall, couldn't reorganise his feet, and the ball flew into the back of the net. And from then on, Falcioni basically was saying this morning that from that moment on, we were just chasing the game and chasing the game, like they were before he arrived. Rupert, it seems to me what you're describing there from, uh, from Boca in the past to, to Falcioni that, uh, uh, I guess, uh, football, like history, kind of goes in cycles. <laughs> and you go from one extreme from, uh, to the other. Uh, Rupert Fryer, uh, thank you so much. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll get you back to talk some uh, um, football argentino uh, again in the, uh, in the very near future. Thanks for having me, Gab. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, Gab. Fasioni, man, man, he is one nasty, unpleasant man. Have you, you watch Boca play, it, it's, it's just incredible. It, you think like sort I of... I love coaches like that, yeah. You like, you like that old school yeah, tech and action. Yeah, you know, all this, all this... No, but he wins, you know? But it's not about winning, it's about playing the game. Ugh. Why do we I exist? I mean, I support a team that used to win 1-0 and that was it, you know? So yeah. what does that tell you about what I like? <laughs> hey, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into, uh, we'll get into a, a league where, uh, which is decidedly more open, actually, than uh, Boca and Falcioni. We're going to be talking uh, some of good old US of A after the break. Welcome back to the World of Football show here on Sports Tonight Live. I'm Mino Rizuki, and again, I'm joined by Gabriele Marcotti. Now we're discussing America and the MLS, and of course, you know, it's the first uh, weekend of the season. David Beckham and his LA Galaxy team got thumped 3-1. Uh, and of course, there's a new club, um, Montreal uh, Impact, which unfortunately they lost to. Uh, but with us now, we have on Skype, Will Kuhn, head, the head of communications for the MLS to tell us about the new league and of course the growing interest uh, by the fans and the attendances. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Because I understand that it's on average 17,000, which is nearly the same as the NBA now, no? Uh, that, that was our average attendance as of uh, last year for the whole year. Uh, our first few games this year were actually a little bit above that. So we're really happy with that. Obviously there's a lot of interest in many of our markets. The league has reached a size now where I think fans can really attach themselves to a club and feel you know, sort of the, 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 the course of the season, and, uh, and it means something to them now. Well, one of the things that's a bit unusual uh, from, for, for MLS is that you're in the U.S., but you have uh, what, three Canadian teams. <laughs> um, there aren't very many, I mean, I guess that there aren't very many examples. Unusual. Well, we have in the Premier League, of course, you know, Swansea, um, I, I guess. But, you know, it's still a bit different. Um, you had to get special permission for that. Uh, as I understand it from from FIFA and also is there a, a cultural difference when it comes to uh, when it comes to Canada and and and, and the sport uh, because obviously the past is or their their soccer history is going to be different from yours well certainly there are cultural differences across the border between us and Canada and there are cultural differences throughout the United States as you know because it's such a big country so the way that the fans support the Houston Dynamo is much different than the way the fans support the Portland Timbers, even though they're both very vibrant fan groups. And uh, obviously in Montreal, we have a French speaking population. And so we're starting to do a lot of our things in French as well as English and Spanish, which we've always done. And uh, so yeah, there, there are some well, unique challenges or, or, or aspects to having teams in two countries. You, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the, the Spanish aspect and uh, um, 
our viewers can look at you, but you, you, there's three words behind you next to the MLS logo, and uh, you can see football on one side, soccer on the other. Exactly, <laughs> that's what I was driving at. Football. I, can you talk a little bit? Because one of the things that strikes me, having been to an MLS game recently, I, 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 I've, I've seen the Philadelphia Union, I, I've seen the New York Red Bulls. What struck me, and this might be an East Coast thing, is that it's almost as if, the, because the fans you know, have their roots and all over, and they might be fans of, of the game in different countries, um, they all bring different qualities of being a fan to the game. So the guys who maybe are influenced by Serie A have a lot of sort of banners with, uh, uh, with rude things written on them. <laughs> the ones who maybe come from a Premier League background or an English a league background will have funny songs with rude things in them. Uh, and uh, uh, the ones who are more into the whole South American, torcida aspect, you know, will, uh, they'll do sort of the jumping and the running. It, it really is like a... <laughs> I, a it's, it's a fantastic spectacle. Honestly, I, I was at a Premier League game this weekend where, you know, you stand up, you say a bad word, you know, the steward comes and taps on your shoulder and, and chucks you out and bans you for the season. I get the sense that at Red Bull Arena, at least, some of that behavior is moderately encouraged. Well, certainly you're right that there's a, a, a diversity of fans in our country and come from not only diverse backgrounds, but diverse soccer cultures. And so you hear songs that sound like songs from other countries. You hear songs that sound like uh, songs you hear in Argentina, in Mexico, in England, in Germany, in Poland, in all our stadiums. In, in different stadiums, uh, you know, cer certainly Chicago has, has traditionally had a strong Eastern European uh, population. And so there, uh, Section 8 supporters tend to have a little bit more of an Eastern European flavor to what they do. Uh, in Houston, there's a very big Mexican-American population, and so Houston Dynamo supporters tend to sing in Spanish, they bring drums to the game, they play the rhythms that you'll hear in, in South America and in Mexico, and, uh, and then certainly in, in Montreal, we're going to get a new flavor, the French uh, aspect of it. And, and that's one of the beauties of, of going to an MLS game, is that it, each and every game is a bit of an international event. Well, I wanted to ask you, for the first weekend of the season, obviously, we, you know, the team that everyone's interested in in the UK is probably LA Galaxy because of David Beckham. They looked a little lethargic uh, when they were playing, a little bit tired from the, the, the game they played previously. But who is the team to watch this season, would you say? Well, certainly the Galaxy is the favorite. There's really no uh, debate. Oh, that's a shame. Can't. We've, we seem to have lost Will at the moment. Well, for those who don't follow uh, uh, MLS that closely, obviously the Galaxy are also talking about uh, about Landon Donovan. Um, of course. It's a very, you know, it's interesting because in MLS they have what they call DPs, which are designated players, because they have a pretty hard salary cap, which means that the most a player can earn in a season is about, I think this season is going to be about $250,000 a year. So it's about 160,000. So it's between sort of three and 4,000 pounds a week. I which had no idea about that. This is the same that you make in a, in a week, a year. The same that I make. Well, no, the no, same me, that but one would make in the Premier League if you're the top. It's a lot less, actually. The, you know, no, you, per you week. No, what they make in a year oh, is yes. what someone makes in a week yeah, in the, the Premier that, League. Well, see if that's the absolute maximum, except for what they call designated players, where uh, originally, each uh, each team could only have one designated player. Some of them said, well, we're not ever interested in, in, uh, in, in using the designated player slot because a designated player slot allows you to go and spend as much as you like on the player. Uh, and so they, they traded them or sold them. So the situation where the New York Red Bulls have three designated players and the uh, LA Galaxy have three, and it's what allows them, for example, to pay um, David Beckham and, it, what, uh, and Landon Donovan. Uh, and it's what allows uh, the New York Red Bulls to go in and play pay Thierry Henry, for example, yeah. or Rafa Marquez, of course, the former Barcelona course. center half uh, at the back. So, but what's interesting is despite this disparity in spending, um, a lot of the teams that do better are the teams that don't go off and, uh, and spend enormous amounts of money on these, on, on these stars. Yeah, as we, as we uh, saw from last season, I'm really looking forward to this one. This could be different. I, I only got into MLS last season. But that, that's unfortunately all we have time for. It's a shame we lost Will at the end there. We have some really dodgy technology, so we, we reckon Raph's probably at the bank. It's the gremlins, yes. Um, but do join us next week. Uh, obviously, Gab will be with me, and, and uh, we'll see you at the same time, same place, and, of course, the same football chat. See you then.
Stay ahead of the game with Sports Tonight Live. Don't miss a thing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Search for Sports Tonight Live on Facebook and like our fan page. Follow Sports Tonight TV on Twitter and tweet us your thoughts and opinions. Sports Tonight Live, it's the platform for the fans. And Cypriot football and the fact that five out of six uh, managers in the, in the top six teams at the moment are changing uh, all the time. It's like a merry-go-round. So do you think Apple is sort of the only example of what's great about Cypriot football? Or? Exactly, Jovanovic is the main reason behind this team's success. I mean, he's the only manager that thinks long term. I mean, you see nearly every club in Cyprus, whenever they sign players, they just bring them in on one year deals, they change the squad. Nearly like 75% of the squad keeps changing every year. And that's the reason why no clubs can gain any stability. Okay, so do you think that at the moment that. Uh, would you say that it's great management of the squad, or is it, do you really think that it's Jovanovic that it, he is the actual reason behind this great success? He is, because he was at Abwell before this um, term. He was also there earlier in 2004, I think. And he spent two years there, so obviously he knew the club very well. So it wasn't as if he was going into a new environment. Uh, um, of course, that was the greatest probably story, other than the fact that Messi broke uh, Champions League records. Um, but what did you think of Nicosia? Do you think that they have a shot further, or it depends? Oh, where... uh, winning the Champions League? <laughs> no, 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 at winning the quarterfinals. If they are teamed with, say, like, you know, let's just say Napoli go through. I mean, it, it obviously all depends. It, it depends on the draw. It depends on what they do on the night. Uh, what I find remarkable about this team is... There's just two things. One is the manager. I, I think Brilliant. I think Jovanovic is just, you know, you talk about a good manager um, making his team more than the sum of their parts. He certainly sums that up. But secondly is the ability on the night that these players have to to just go to the next level. I, I mean, except for Tchaikovsky, you know, Charlambidis maybe 10 years ago, <laughs> possibly, you know, these guys would have been possibly Champions League caliber players. None of the others are. Yeah. Uh, by any stretch, if you look at their past, where they came from, um, and yet on the night they, they come together and make a difference. Uh, I spoke to uh, um, a guy I know who, who's a scout, um, and his team had deputized him to go and uh, and watch them in their uh, in a third third round uh, third prelim round against uh, Wisla Krakow, and they went out there watched the first leg, and he was like he wasn't really that impressed, and kind of said, all right, these guys are obviously going on the return, and. And boom, they play the first half hour like you know crazy whirling dervishes, and uh, and Krakow don't know what hit them. And if you look at it, that's something that repeated itself, you know, against Shakhtar Donetsk, yes. against Porto, you know, this they, they can just take it to to a different level and then sort of go back to normality. I think that you know, whilst you're mentioning the good coach, I think it's also important to to point out the fact that they have a great management, and they are someone who have stuck together with their coach. They took the money that they had from their first Champions League outing, reinvested it back in the squad when the likes of Ammonia are like um, sort of squandering money and having to go through financial debt and everyone's sort of playing for a six month plan. These guys have taken players like Nuno Moraes, built their team around it. And I think that a management has come through, stuck together with the coach, which is quite unusual. Welcome to another episode of the World of Football Show here on Sports Tonight Live. I'm Mina Rizuki and I'm joined by the best European football expert, Gabriele Marcotti, my co-presenter. You're so kind. Are we going to say nice <laughs> things to each other the whole show this time around? Yeah, I'm going to go for the nice thing today. <laughs> well, as you can see, it's just the, uh, it's just the two of us uh, uh, this week, but that's good because... Um, you know, more space for us in our opinions. Exactly, and that way we don't have to argue, um, or at least, you know, well, I think well, we can be nice to each other now that there's no third person. I think, I think we certainly can without <laughs> that, that strange German influence. But <laughs> the other good news is we've got some great Skypers lined up to, uh, for you today. We're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to start Different out talking leagues. some... Yeah, yeah, we're going to start out. Apple. Exactly. Cyprus and Applewell. Well, I understand for Cyprus. We've got our Skyper with us, and we've got Andreas Vu. Hello, how are you, Andreas? Can you hear me? 
Andres? I'm not sure he can hear us. No. Maybe he can, uh, he can join us in a, in, in a minute or two. Uh, well, you know, Andres is going to be talking to us about, uh, about Cypriot football and uh, sort of where, we, where they are right now and, and really whether Apple rep represents some kind of uh, resurgence or whether there's deeper issues there. This is what he's saying. He was saying that in, in his article that he wrote, he was saying that five out of the six uh, teams, you know, the top six, are sort of, you know, always changing their coaches. There's no youth development at the moment. And people sort of under, you know, youngsters have to go to military service. And that at the moment, they're sort of taking that route where they say, oh, Cyprus, how far can we get? And you can see it's really something different. Can you hear us now, Andreas? Yes, yeah, now I can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Um, we were reading your article, and you were talking about sort of the growing crisis.